Well, good morning. Uh, for those of you that picked up one of the uh, order of worship, you'll see that I am Betsy. Um, trying to do my notes. I'm trying to follow this. Okay, uh, announcements should be up here. Uh, food ministry. Any any words on the food ministry or BG food pantry? It's still there. Good. Hope everybody had a good New Year's Eve. And please note and say hi to our snowbirds that have managed to make it back since the temperature rose above 30 degrees. <laughs> when it was really cold, we didn't see them, did we? <laughs> anyway, Bible studies, Gene. We do have Bible study continues uh, this Wednesday at 7, and we are on session 6, I believe, of the Epic of Eden, and it's Zoom, and it's also uh, here at the church, and we'll continue on for another eh, six weeks or so. It's the 12 weeks, uh, six, this is the halfway through, so come and join us if you'd like on Wednesday at 7. Thanks. Thank you, Gene. Yep. Uh, Char has left a very complete note for me, which I will not read at all. I apologize, my apologies to Char. Um, but basically is uh, they will resume studies on uh, January 4, um, chapter 10, invitation to abundance. Uh, the remaining lessons will be on January 18, and then they'll start a new study, unforgotten lessons from, lessons from less known women of the Bible. And that's going to, yeah. Anyway, it's going to continue. Sorry. Uh, three poinsettias should go today. And there are plastic sleeves available for those. We haven't managed to kill them yet, so you still have some time. Um, Invitation, uh, right now you have an invitation for other announcements that are for the good of the order. And thank you for waiting for the <laughs> mic. I should have mentioned when you had the food ministry, we're starting the uh, BG school um, mission where we're going to collect uh, food items for snacks, more snack items and uh, school supplies and toiletry items for the school. So each month we'll have a different uh, thing featured in those categories. So watch the newsletter for more details on that. Um, I think January is backpacks. I can't remember what the other ones are, but um, so keep an eye out for that in the newsletter. El Elizabeth, before you put the mic away or hand it to Scott, wasn't there, a, was it you that contacted the school system and found out there was maybe a deficit of about a thousand dollars of unpaid lunches for the kids? Yes. And yes. that's another area that if mm -hmm. we wanted to have a contribution, you know, you can just mark it on your check as you give it to First Christian and then we'll make sure it gets to uh, the school system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, that's all I have for announcements. We're good? We're good. Let us now prepare to uh, worship. Please rise. <coughs> Shout to the Lord your praise. For God's might and power are established in the universe. Come, let us worship God, whose light burst forth into our darkness. God of hope and light, your good news has been emblazoned across the skies, the great starry night of Jesus' birth, sung by angels, celebrated by shepherds, witnessed by animals. You have given to us a new chance, 
a reminder of your continual love for us. Be with us in this worship, we pray. Guide our thoughts, our lives, our spirits. Heal and restore us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, at this time, if you would look around and share the peace. It, it used to really be fun back in the good old days when we could, it, it was like herding cats trying to get everybody back yeah, together. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you'd like to, you sure can. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel comfortable. Next time. Yep. Yep. The invitation is there. Uh, let's see. Sharing the peace. Our, our, our hymn of praise is Angels from the Realm of Glory. Please be seated. Uh, now comes the exciting part. I've already thanked Jean because this is the first time in the Old Testament reading that I knew the words, all of them. Now, if I say them right, that'll be a different. Well, we'll, we'll see. It's kind of like that uh, field goal that the. the yeah, it, it, I might shank it. I don't know. I'm sorry. Sorry. My team had already lost. Isaiah 63, verses 7 through 9. I will tell, the Lord, tell of the Lord's unfailing love. I will praise the Lord for all he has done. I will rejoice in his great goodness to Israel, which he has granted according to his mercy and love. He said, these are my very own people. Surely they will not betray me again. And he became their savior. And all their suffering, he also suffered. And he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them throughout all the years. May the Lord add blessings to this reading. Come on. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. 
get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's reports of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are now dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of, Is- of, Je- of Jesus, the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called a Nazarene. Happy New Year, everyone. Does it feel like a new year? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Well, no sooner is Christmas over with, Christmas Day is done, it's like a, just a glimmer in our past now. Right? No sooner is Christmas over than so much other stuff begins. In our world, everyone rushes out the next day or soon after for the same. I've already had people tell me, oh, I got my, you know, they got a Christmas tree two or three days after Christmas because it went from like $250 to $45, right? Because you've got to go out and get all the after Christmas sales that they want to get rid of stuff, right? We go out after Christmas and get uh, cards, ornaments, wrapping paper, lights, you know, all that kind of stuff. We go to exchange the gifts that either don't, we, they don't, we don't like, but you can't tell anybody that, right? Or they don't fit, or the combination of some, the, the, maybe a, multiple combinations of those things, and we rush to take the tree down. Everybody, you got your tree still up? Somebody got your tree up. How many got your tree down? Oh, it's about half and half. That's not bad. Wow, yeah. Not because it's a live tree. Do you have a live tree? Yeah, is it up still? Yeah, yeah. Most of us have artificial trees. We take them down not because, you know, it's not a live tree and it's starting to dry out and the needles are starting to fall off of it, which happens, but because, you know, Christmas is over, right? It's over, finished, done. So what does it mean to us that Christmas Day has happened? Now that it's almost, well, it's actually a week, right? It's a week past. What is it that reminds us that Christmas was even here? The bill. The bill. (laughs) Right. Have you read ahead? You I read ahead. Huh. No, I'm thinking of my favorite. <laughs> you can tell Christmas has happened because, you know, the Christmas music, in, the, as, <clears throat> in my office anyway, I'm in charge of the music that plays over the speakers in the hallways and stuff. We just use an iPad and get onto, you know, iHeartRadio or whatever and play music. And the payroll ladies in the hallway that I'm in, They wanted, you know, they begged for Christmas music in October. It was like, can we play Christmas music? So I said, I don't care, we'll play whatever you want, right? And now they're begging for it to be something else, you know. Can we stop playing Christmas music, you know, right? The 24-7 Christmas stations on the radio, right? Most of them, I think most of them have returned to their normal programming. There's not the 24-7 Christmas music on the radio. The large piles of cardboard, wrapping paper, trash that accumulates. You know, reminds us that Christmas has happened. And the sidewalks and the, and the garage may be littered with bags and bags of trash. Piles of it. Boxes, big ones, small ones, little ones, plastic packaging, wrapping paper, bows and ribbons, all find their way to the trash, right, soon after Christmas is over. A friend of mine this week just, re- she said that you know, she's finally done lugging the last of the five bags of trash out of the house from Christmas, right? 
2005 article in USA Today reported that the week between December 25th and January 1st is the single busiest week for those in the garbage business. Yep, this is, a pretty, this is amazing. Americans, it seems, generate 25% more waste during that week than the average week any other time. That adds up to almost, or more than, a million extra tons of trash just in that week alone. Jeez. Erica Cook, who works for Waste Management, the biggest trash hauler in the country, said, all the wrapping paper and boxes add a lot of bulk. There's food from the gatherings, the turkey carcasses, right? You can experience what people got for Christmas. It's a chance to see who was naughty and nice. Did you hear that? Did you get that a little bit, right? You can experience what people got for Christmas by their trash. Wow. You can tell Christmas has come and gone because of the mess that's left behind, huh? But sure, surely the coming of Jesus leaves us with something more than a million extra tons of trash, right? When we read the gospel story for today from Matthew, we learn that even after that very first Christmas day when Jesus was born, after the birth had taken place, there was stuff, stuff that needed to be done and dealt with. And similar to trash, it wasn't all good stuff, was it? Herod was lurking around the corner, unaware of what was happening, until some sages or kings or magi, whatever you want to call them, came to him with an inquiry, an inquiry that sent him into a, a, just a silent rage, right? Where is this child, they asked, who has been born king of the Jews? Can you imagine going to a king and saying, hey, we want to go see this other king. Can you tell us where he's at? The point, I think, for Matthew was to create a scenario in which his audience can draw, could draw a parallel between the child who had just been born and one of the greatest leaders in Jewish history, Moses, right? We had the scripture I read had two or three references to, well, this was said to fulfill the prophet, what the prophet said. This was said to fulfill what the prophet said. Matthew is setting up his audience for something. Matthew wants people, his readers, to understand that just as Moses led his people out of Egypt into a land of freedom, so this little child would lead his people into a new reality, a reality known as the reign of God. But already at the very beginning of the story, that message contains within it the suggestion that this child's story isn't going to be some sweet fairy tale leading up to a happily ever after ending. We may sing away in the manger and pretend at least for that moment that Jesus is the perfect baby. He's the perfect baby, right? right? No crying he makes. Right? But that's our attempt to turn the story into something it's not, it isn't really that, right? Chances are Jesus cried a lot. We know from the Gospels that more, the more Jesus saw of the world in which he lived, the more he must have mourned over it and for it. For a Jesus who doesn't weep with those who weep, a Jesus who's just a, sent, a, just a sentimental myth, maybe the one that our culture prefers, right? But not the Jesus, that's not the Jesus that we need. The one we need is the one who can sift through the trash of our world with us and help us not to become suffocated by it. Herod represents the dark side of the gospel. He reminds us that Jesus didn't enter into a world of sparkly Christmas decorations or a world of warm spiritual sentiment. Jesus entered into a world of real pain. Real pain. A, a world of serious dysfunction, a world of brokenness and political oppression. Jesus was born an outcast, a homeless person, a refugee, and, he fin and finally he becomes a victim to the powers that be. Jesus didn't enter into the, what, uh, what maybe, uh, did you have a perfect Christmas? Right? Uh, no. No? Wow. Close. Close, right, close. You know, that wasn't, the world wasn't perfect when Jesus entered into it. And he's the perfect savior for outcasts, refugees, and the nobodies of his world. <clears throat> and maybe that's the problem, right? 
chances are it's difficult for us to associate ourselves with those kind of people. And so we never really take the message of Christmas to heart as much as we could. Most of us sitting here today are among the fortunate of society, aren't we? We have enough to eat. I have more than enough to eat, and I eat more than I should. And I probably throw away more food than uh, enough food to feed others, right? The places we have places to live that shelter us from the elements, which we were all thankful for last week when the weather was awful, right? right? Safe water to drink, and I don't have to walk anywhere to go get water, right? I turn the little knob and water comes out. Right? Easy access, we have easy access to most any, everything we could ever want. We don't associate with lowly shepherds or outcasts. If we sing of shepherds abiding in the fields, we don't stop to consider that these people weren't allowed in the temple, right? Because they were considered unclean people. You can't come in because you're unclean. Instead, we elevate them to the fortunate few who were able to visit the newborn child that night so long ago, and we forget their tragic situation, right? They were outcasts. Maybe that's the problem with Christmas, and especially this time immediately following all the festivities. We have sung our Deck the Halls and Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and we're not quite sure what to do next. We're not, I, I told Mike when we were walking up, I said, I'm not sure if I'm, should, I'm supposed to light the Advent candles or not. It's this time between Christmas and Epiphany, and, you know, do we take the decorations down today, and when do we take the tree down? We're not sure what to do next. In our homes, we gather up the trash that's relatively easy to discard, right? We may even hit the stores and keep busy for a few more days. I'm fortunate enough, I, got, I, get to, I don't have to work tomorrow, right? It's a great day off. Right? But what will I do with it? But then what? What do we do when, you know, everything's kind of put away? What do we do with the letdown after Christmas? And maybe it's a time to contemplate what the birth of the, and the life of this child meant for the world in his time and what he means for us today. <clears throat> we could begin with what it might have meant for Jesus and his parents to flee to Egypt to escape Herod's wrath and what, a living, and what living in a strange country might have meant for his growth and development. Matthew sets up, you know, the details, you know, it helps Matthew to uh, set Jesus up as a new deliverer. But a deliverer from what? Right? What's he here to deliver us from? What was, what was he here to deliver them from? Right? We all know what the people of that time and place wanted. They wanted a Messiah who would charge onto the scene with an army behind him and vanquish Herod and the Romans from their land. Right? Take, get the occupiers out of here, Jesus. Take over. Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Nazareth, all this and more was part of the promised land, land they felt, right, they felt God had given them, land they believed they had lost because of their sinfulness. But they still felt it belonged to them and not Caesar and his occupying, occupying army that kept them all in check. They had waited and waited and waited for another Moses, another David, another deliverer. And now Matthew is suggesting that he's here, that he's been born, that oppression will cease. Eventually, despite the hope that Matthew offers, many were disappointed. And we know they were disappointed because not many followed Jesus. When Matthew began his story, he knew how it would end. He knew the rest of the story, right? To quote Paul Harvey. So why did he make the connection between Jesus and Moses? How or why did he raise such false hopes for those people? Maybe to Matthew it wasn't a false hope. Maybe he understood the real hope that this tiny child brought into the world. Yet in his attempts to convey the story to his Jewish audience, he may have made certain connections that were as misleading as they may have been helpful. Perhaps then, as now, it depends upon what or whom it is we're looking and searching for. Back then it was a warrior like Messiah. Someone to come in and take over and show Caesar, you know, Herod and all the people that were occupying who's boss. But that person never came. Instead, 
the Prince of Peace came, and few were ready for him. Perhaps so few were ready for him because Jesus had the expectation that those who followed him would join him, his vision and help him with the work that needed to be done. Healing for those who were broken in heart and spirit. Food for those who didn't have enough. Concern for those who lived in isolation and abandonment. For those in prison. Compassion for those whom society rejected. Too often, perhaps, when we seek a Messiah, we're looking for someone who will do it all for us who will bind up wounds and offer compassion while we stand by cheering them on. Good job, good job, way to go, yeah, good job, way to go. Cheerleaders, yeah. Each year we wait for Christmas as though it is the answer to our prayers. And in many ways it is, in many ways it is. It brings us the message of hope and peace and love and joy. Not as easy sentiments, but as visions of what we need to work on each and every day to bring the reign of God to fruition in our world. Last Sunday, I used a new benediction, and I'm going to share it here today as well. We'll use it today, too. Howard Thurman, preacher and scholar, wrote a book entitled The Work of Christmas. The Work of Christmas. As we prepare, the, the days before Christmas, it seems like work, doesn't it? Getting everything ready, all the parties, all the stuff we got to do, decorations. And now it's the work after Christmas, get everything taken care of. So the work of Christmas. In it, he speaks of the mission we now have because of Christmas. Christmas brings us a new mission. Because Christ came among us, Thurman wrote these words. When the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princesses have all gone home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost. To heal the broken to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the hearts. How beautiful he summarized the work of Christmas. Because Christmas isn't just a pretty time of year, is it? It's about more than presents and trees and parties and celebrations. And some of us may consider that a tremendous amount of work. So that by the time Christmas comes, we're just exhausted, right? Let's get this stuff out of here and put it away. I'm tired, right? Let's get done with Christmas. But we're reminded the Christmas, the work of Christmas begins now. The real work of Christmas begins after the celebration, when we stop to contemplate why, why this child was born. Why, why was this child born? When we realize that his message wasn't just for a short time, wasn't just for that one night that we sing Silent Night and we celebrate and we, all the good feelings that we have, it's just not that one time. He was born for a lifetime. That's what we're left with after the celebration of December 25th. We can all take something away from Christmas. I mean, that's the question, isn't it? What'd you get for Christmas, Mike? You forgot already. Oh, my gosh. The batteries have worn out. You've thrown it away. You've broken it. Whatever. <laughs> Don't we, though? That's the question we ask people. What'd you get for Christmas? You getting anything nice for Christmas? What'd you get for Christmas, right? We can all take something from Christmas. Something real, something tangible, something we can share with others all the year through. Because if the only thing we got from Christmas relates to the trash at the curb, the world will never improve. And the message of this tiny child gets abandoned with that trash at the curb. that we celebrate the birth of that child that you have sent to this world and to us. We celebrate. We decorate our homes. We put up fancy lights and shiny objects and ornaments and decorations. We have parties. We gather together to celebrate this child. Remind us that now, as we put this, the decorations and the, the symbols of Christmas away, that the work of Christmas begins now in our hearts to be his presence in this world today. It's in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Each week in worship, we offer an invitation that comes in three ways for those who have never made a confession of faith and wish to do so today. If today you would like to rededicate, rededicate your life to Christ, 
come forward as we stand and sing. And lastly, if you'd like to transfer your membership from one church family to Bowling Green Christian Church, come forward as we sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. <coughs> Any prayer concerns, celebrations that need to be lifted up? Scott's got a microphone, so I do have a few. If nobody else has anything, let's pray for Mark, or for Mark, Marge. Marge's got her hand up. I just want to thank everybody for all the love and prayers you sent our way. And also thank you for the flowers. Thank you, all of you. You've been so kind. If everyone could pray for my mom, she went under hospice care this past week. She's doing okay, but she just doesn't want to do anything to find out anything, or she's, she's pretty much come to the conclusion that she's going to die, and that's that. So <laughs> probably not anytime soon, but who knows? Mm. So. Louise. Yeah, I just want to thank, uh, thank God for a successful procedure for my wife. She recently had a loop recorder you know, for monitoring her heart rate and everything. And everything's gone good so far. 
And uh, please continue to pray for healing of her of her heart problems as well. Absolutely. That's good news. Good to hear. Yes. Uh, we just have to remember Miranda at the loss yes. of her husband, Joe. Yep. And Rhoda. Yeah. I got a couple here. Make sure I get everybody in here. Continue to pray for Marge and Luke, obviously. Um, I've got uh, Rhoda and Miranda as well. Um, Mark, um, who I, um, when I um, do uh, announce basketball games for Defiance College, Mark is a official bookkeeper. Work, you know, he's official book. <clears throat> he's been off for a few weeks now, um, getting his foot. Uh, there was some, at one point in time, there was a possibility he was going to lose his leg, um, but he was in a care facility, and he was at the game yesterday afternoon, first game he's been to, I don't know how long. Things are healing up well, and he's very, uh, very positive. Um, so I'm very, help, I'm very thankful that uh, Mark is starting to heal up. Uh, my daughter, uh, Kelsey, and the two granddaughters, Madison and Taylor, are traveling back from Florida at some point in time today. They're down there playing softball tournament. Madison's playing the softball tournament. I'm trying to say, win or lose today, they got to play another game. So they'll, if they win the first one, they go to the final game, and they win the championship, they win that one. So it's a combination of we want to win, but we want to get home. We want to win, but we want to get home. <laughs> and they're driving, so I pray for them. <coughs> uh, my, a good friend of mine, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Brenda and Steve, her husband Steve, I um, worked with Brenda at Fulton County when I worked for the county, up, and then Brenda uh, moved to Cincinnati, and I did Brenda and Steve's wedding a few years back, and uh, Steve's dad passed on Christmas morning, or Christmas afternoon, so I want to pray for Steve's family, and uh, my Uncle Jim has uh, COVID, and Jay and Amy are traveling. I'm not sure where they're at, right? Anybody know where they're at for sure? I know they were headed to Fort Wayne at some point in time, but I'm not sure how far they got yet, so, so uh, they're traveling to uh, Arizona. So those are the ones I have in my list. So thank you all for lifting all those folks up. Anything else? Any one last thing? Nope. Let's go to God in prayer. Eternal God, whose spirit whispers in the calm of evening, who calls in the quiet dawn, broods over the great deep, and dwells in the hearts of mortals, we rejoice in your self revealing birth at Bethlehem. Cleanse our eyes to see the Christ, and open our heart to receive him. Give us grace to bring the best of our hearts, as, as our heart's devotion. Help us to live in the spirit of, gracious, of this gracious season. When giving comes easy and the warmth of company and friends and family, teach us to be kind to one another always, to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as you have forgiven us, regardless of the season. Help us to be humble, for we know our weaknesses. Deliver us, deliver, deliver us from our, our foolish pride and vain conceit. Renew in us the gentle spirit of childhood, and help us to offer to you hearts that are useful as your dwelling places. To you, O giver of joy, we praise you that in the fullness of time you came to be with us and to give us hope, peace, love, and joy. And we thank you that in Mary you found one who would be willing to give us of her life, trusting in you for the sake of your love for us. Forgive us for our frequent unwillingness to let your joy spring to life in our midst and the self-centeredness that has kept us from re revealing the fullness of your joy in our living. Refashion us that we might recognize the greatness of your gift and to release the joy that you have planted deeply within us in creation and in our baptism. We pray for all your children in their need. To those who are fearful and oppressed, give them freedom. To those who are hungry and homeless, give help. To those who are lonely and grieving, give your peace. And to those who are sick, give healing and hope. O God, who comes to us in Jesus Christ of Bethlehem, in these wonderfully busy days, may we not crowd you out of our mind as he was crowded out of the inn on that first Christmas. Even as the tinsel and lights of the season begin to fade away. Time and again we pray that you would draw us back to his manger bed. Rekindle our sense of wonder and worship. Forgive our cynicism and pride. Banish our doubts and restore our faith 
and the things we cannot see or hear. The star that shines in human souls and the song of peace that lingers over a world so troubled. Like the shepherds, may we return to our humble lives knowing that heaven is not some distant place, but is ever near because of the coming of the Christ child, and that in him you have revealed yourself here among people like us. Hear our prayers for those in need today, for healing and peace, reconciliation and joy, and we pray especially for Luke and Marge, for Rhoda and Miranda's family, for Mark as he continues to heal, for my daughter Kelsey and the girls who are traveling home, for Brenda and Steve, and as Steve knows, um, the pain of, of the death of his father, may he also be embraced by the memories of his life shared with him. We pray for all of those who are traveling, Jay and Amy, for those who are sick this day, and we pray that you meet us where we are in our journey of faith. Most gracious God, we praise you on this first day of the new year where possibilities seem endless. Help us not get, to not get bogged down in expectations that disappoint and resolutions that fail, but instead set our hearts on you, living into your intention for our lives. May we seek your wisdom in new ways this year. May we grow closer to you through spiritual practice, whether reading more of the Holy Scriptures, spending time in prayer, or in your glorious creation, caring for the earth as well as our bodies, spending time in silence. Whatever we do, may we do so with the intention of knowing you more deeply in our lives, as your intention for us is to have life and have life abundantly in you. We thank you for the past year and all the blessings and challenges that we have made it through, and we thank you for the days ahead as you lead us as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> it's that time of uh, our service for the offertory. By the goodness of God, we are called into the family of the church. By God's grace, we rejoice and share in, in the church's life, mission, and ministry. Let us offer our tithes and gift to God's glory as a token of the offering of our very lives. And O oh God, through these offerings these, of these gifts, may we become people of a more open mind in hearing your words and wisdom, open-hearted in the healing the broken word, open-handed in healing your call to charity and acting love. With thanks for all good gifts, we present a portion of our substance and our whole of ourselves to you. Amen. Uh, the communion hymn is 163 in the Chalice Hymnal, Good Christian Friends Rejoice.
So this past week on Tuesday, uh, I had a uh, MRI scheduled. I had gone to the doctor a week or two ago, whatever it was. I don't forget how long ago it was, and uh, for a, just other stuff. And, and I said, you know, I said, I said I'm having more frequent headaches than I think I should be having. I said I'm not sure if I'm just sleeping on the pillow wrong, or if the church people are causing me to have headaches. <laughs> I'm not <really> sure. <laughs> he said, well, you know. So we talked about it a little bit. And he said, you know, we could do an MRI just to make sure. You know, I said, that's fine. And mind you, I, I detest MRI machines. Um, I had one done, I don't know, a few years back on my shoulder. Had an extruded disc and, uh, or something like that. And so I had to have an MRI. So I laid down on a little you know, table. And I thought, this isn't bad. And then they went, Vroom, and I said, oh, get me out of here. You know, so that's not good. You've got to warn me about that kind of stuff before you, you know, my nose is this far away from this big whatever it was. And uh, so I was, you know, not looking forward to going and getting the MRI done, right? And I said, I told the guy when I walked in, you know, well, last time I did this, I kind of freaked out because it was, uh, yeah, we, people handle it differently. I said, so I'm going to lay down. I said, but give me a couple minutes. And he said, I'm going to close my eyes, put a little cloth around my, cloth my eyes so I don't have the temptation to open my eyes and we'll get this thing done. He said, yeah, we'll get it done. I said, all right. So he goes in and I know what's going on. I just, you, know, you lay there and think, don't open your eyes, don't open your eyes, don't open your eyes. And, you know, the other one's going, open your eyes, open your eyes. But no, not doing it. So we got done, 15 minutes. It's not long. It doesn't take long. All the noises going off and all the clicks and clanks. It was like 7 o'clock in the morning. Went back to work, at work. I don't know, half an hour or so later, I get a call from the Fulton County Health Center and the, the technician, Phil. Hey, this is Phil at MRI. He said, you were in just this morning to get an MRI done. I said, yep. And I'm thinking, wow, that was fast. What the heck is wrong, right? Yeah. And uh, he says, well, he says, uh, sadly, he says, I did your neck instead of your head. So... Could you come back in and do it again? <laughs> and I said, well, I could, but. <laughs> yeah, so I had to gather up all the strength and courage I had to go back to the hospital, get back on the table, and get back underneath that thing for another 15 minutes or so. And he was laughing. I was kind of laughing about it, not really laughing about it. <laughs> I don't want to make him feel bad, but. So I got two for one that day. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Everything's good. The, the, the brain, all things good on the brain. He said, nothing's there. And I said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> he says, it's not abnormal. I said, well, I, I call shenanigans on that, too, because there's nothing normal about this. And, uh, and he said, and so then like three or four days later, I get the results from the neck. So he says, you know, I think the results on the neck. I said, hey, you know, I'll get a free one. I thought maybe I'd get comped like a room or something free at the hospital at some point in time. Who knows? Um, but seriously, you know, that moment when it's like, oh, i got to go do that again? Oh, are you kidding me? You know, and gathering up all the courage and strength to get mentally prepared and emotionally. You know, just that whole part of it was a struggle that I had to go get it done. I had to do it, you know. And I, as I'm thinking about today, and I've told that story a few times, and I think, you know, there was a moment, there had to be that moment. We know that moment when Jesus is in the garden saying, you know, this isn't, this isn't what I want to do, but God, if you're calling me to do this, I'm going to follow what you have called me to do, right? This is what you're going to do, right? And he did. He went to the garden. He fulfilled his uh, call, and he met with the disciples. Excuse me for reaching there. I about kicked the donkey. In his, that upper room, he shared with his disciples, you know, the the moment that he realizes that he's going to do what, what probably the most difficult thing he could do. He said, take this bread. And he broke it and he shared it with them and said, take and eat for this is my body which will be broken for you, for you. And he took a cup soon after. He gave thanks for the cup. And he shared it with his disciples and said, take and drink of this cup for it's a new covenant in my blood. My blood shed for you. Heavenly Father, just last Sunday we praised the birth of your only son, the child that became the light, that man that loved us so much he was willing to die for us, the man that taught us to love and help others. Just as he shared the bread and cup with his disciples in the upper room, we too today take the bread and cup as reminders of his sacrifice for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
Really? We should? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I need him. <laughs> it is time to stand for our closing hymn. Another year is dawning. Number 811, the uh, celebration hymnal. We got this one up there. All right, we're going to do this one today. I got one. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Amen.